The context to today's discussion is obviously that we look around and we can see and hear about so much promise in terms of the plethora of technologies and innovation. Hear about things like 3D printing, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, driverless cars and an internet of things. But then the reality of what we actually experience is, is somewhat different, obviously, from this promise. It's permanent slump, secular stagnation, growing inequality, and ecological crises. And we, we're constantly told about all this technology and how it's going to lead us to having uh, you know, li lives of leisure. And, uh, and, and we're supposed to be surrounded by these abundance of time-saving devices. And yet, actually, we're working harder than ever. Um, in fact, this is shown in the statistics, how there's been a rise in productivity in society, and yet this has not equaled a rise in living standards and a rise in real wages. So, so just some statistics. from In the first decade of this century, in the USA, which obviously is the, the most advanced capitalist country in the world, we have uh, productivity growth for that decade on average of 2.5% per year, and yet real wage growth of 1.5% per year. So you see that although there's all this new technology, new productivity, it doesn't equal uh, a, a, you know, a, a similar and equivalent standard in terms of the rate rising of uh, wages and living standards. And the result is that basically labor, i.e. the working class, is receiving uh, a much decreased share of the total wealth in society. And this is a case in all countries. You see the statistics of the share of GDP going to labor, to wages, and, uh, and it's actually declining in all countries, in the USA, UK, and Germany, but also in the more emerging economies like in Mexico and uh, China. And uh, that means that the, that the actual share going to profits is increasing, um, and therefore, what we're really seeing is that all this new technology, this increased productivity, is not going to rise, rising living standards, but is actually going to increase pr uh, profits. Um, rather than raising uh, our wages or reducing the hours of the working week, what we see is this contradiction, really, of uh, technology being used to create mass unemployment on the one hand, as uh, workers are replaced by machines, but on the other hand, obviously, those who are in work are working harder uh, for less pay. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is why? How have we really got ourselves into this situation as a society? And it all goes really back to the fact that capitalism is a system of production for profit based on private ownership and this uh, relationship between wage labor, on the one hand, the working class, and capital, the capitalist class. Uh, and all the value, as we've explained in other sessions this weekend, all value in society is ultimately created by labor. It's, uh, and the surplus value, you see, is, uh, is basically the unpaid labor of the working class. That uh, value above and beyond what is needed to maintain the working class as a whole. And that surplus value, in turn, is the source of profits, of interest, and of rent. In other words, the, the, the money flowing to the, to the financiers, the capitalists, and the bosses, and so forth. Now, the capitalists have as their task, the individually, to try and increase their surplus value. And they do this by, uh, Marx explains in Capital, they do this in two ways, primarily. One is to increase what he called the absolute surplus value. In other words, just increasing the hours of the working day, just so that you're working longer, uh, and, uh, but for the same pay, ultimately, and increasing the amount of surplus value that's produced. The other way Marx talked about was to increase what he called the relative surplus value, the, the rate of exploitation, the ratio of surplus value to, to wages. And this primarily, Marx explained, came from increasing productivity, uh, increasing the quantity of use values, the quantity of wealth that could be produced for a given quantity of labor time. And this is really the role of technology under capitalism. It's to increase this relative surplus value, uh, to increase the ratio of surplus uh, relative to wages. Now, this, uh, this, this, this ratio, this rate of exploitation, is a, there's an average across society. And, uh, and over time, the average is, uh, is, is, is increased uh, 
by a, a kind of dialectical process under capitalism where it's uh, an anarchic process ultimately pursue, you know, that arrived at through the pursuit of individual aims. Capitalism is, is based on private production with no uh, planning between the different capitalists, although there's an immense level of planning within the firm, within businesses, between businesses, it's anarchic. It's, uh, it's, it's all down to the individual capitalists pursuing their own individual aims. So each individual capitalist is aiming to lower his or her costs of production below the social average, the socially necessary labor time, as Marx called it. Um, basically trying to outcompete their rivals uh, by, by producing for less than this average and therefore gaining super profits and, or being able to then lower their prices below that of their competitors, push other people out of the market and, uh, and, and gain access to an even greater market share. Now, the, the result of each individual capitalist doing this and pursuing their own individual aims is that over time, uh, a new socially necessary average labor time is, uh, is arrived at. Each individual capitalist um, is basically uh, pursuing the, the, their own aims, trying to uh, you know, in, invest in technology and automation and so forth, replacing uh, workers with machines, lowering their costs, but over time, obviously, that, that, that new technology becomes generalized. Each uh, capitalist has to kind of follow their other competitors and install the same kind of technology in order to keep up, or obviously they fall back and they're out of the race. And, uh, and so eventually, over time, the super profits from new technologies disappear, and a new, uh, a new ratio of, uh, of, 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 of surplus value to wages, this, this new rate of exploitation, on, on the basis of a new level of uh, productivity in the economy is established across the whole of society. And it's this kind of uh, drive under capitalism that Marx actually highlighted gave capitalism such a revolutionary and progressive character in its heyday. The fact that, um, that you, were, you had this competition that forced the capitalists to invest in new machinery and new technology Get it. That was what drove capitalism forwards in its heyday to invent new technologies, to develop science and industry and technique and so forth, and, uh, and, and try and basically it was the drive for profits that actually took society forwards. And ultimately it came down to the nature of capitalism, this, this wage-labor uh, capital relationship, because what you have under capitalism, unlike previous class societies, is now that you have a working class that's paid a wage in exchange for the only thing it has to sell, which is its labor power. In other words, its ability to work. What the capitalist buys is not the worker themselves, but rather their ability to work for a set period of time, whether it's an hour, a day, a week, or a year. And, uh, and this is different from previous modes of production. Under slavery, the, the slave themselves was the tool, if you like. They, they, they were bought themselves. They, they, the, the, the capitalist, or rather the, the slave owner, rather, bought the slave uh, as, a, as a tool, just like a, a piece of cattle, basically. And, uh, and they would work that slave to the bone. And once they were, they were, they were, they were spent, either they were dead or, or beyond their years, they would be cast aside and new slaves would be bought in their place. So there was no real incentive under that kind of mode of production to actually invest in, uh, in, in more productivity. You just worked your slaves harder and bought more slaves. Um, under feudalism, you had a situation where the, the, the serfs were, were working on the land and, uh, and basically the, the, the feudal lords were appropriating a certain proportion of, that, uh, of the produce, but they were just basically consuming it themselves. It wasn't exchanged, it wasn't being sold for a market. And therefore, again, there was no real incentive to try and get more labor out of the, uh, out of the, uh, out of the serfs. You just had, you tried to get more land. Was the, the, the land was the, the primary uh, factor in that mode of production. But what makes capitalism so revolutionary is now you're buying the time of the, the worker. You're buying the, the labor time and uh, the labor power, rather and uh, the ability to work. And it's up to the capitalists then to try and squeeze as much uh, use value, as much wealth out of the worker within that time as possible. And they do that by raising productivity, by, by, by putting more machinery behind the elbow of the worker so that they can produce more goods in the same amount of time. And that's what makes capitalism so revolutionary. But looking at 
capitalism and comparing it to these other class societies, you also see how what Marx always explained, which is that technology is not some sort of uh, manna from heaven. It doesn't just fall from the sky, but it requires a certain material conditions in order to develop. Technology isn't just, uh, as we discussed in the science session yesterday, is that, you know, it's not just down to individual geniuses inventing these things. It requires certain material conditions to actually pave the way, ultimately certain social relations. Um, because, uh, you know, it's, it, as, as we see, it took the wage-labor-capital relationship, that social relation, to be established in order to drive technology forwards. You see an enormous increase in productivity exponentially from the beginning of capitalism. For, and for centuries before, productivity is relatively stagnant and growth is relatively stagnant. But suddenly, capitalism comes along with this new social relations that gives a, 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 an actual material conditions that, that drives technology forwards and that's what propelled forward to the Industrial Revolution and all these sorts of things. It wasn't just the great individual geniuses, people like James Watt inventing the steam engine, but rather the whole mode of production that paved the way and demanded uh, increases in technology. Um, and, uh, and, and you can see this actually quite clearly. This example of the steam engine and James Watt is a good example because actually the steam engine was originally developed by uh, a figure called Hero of Alexandria back in slave society and uh, back in ancient times. But it was a toy. The steam engine that he invented was a toy, basically, for the, for the ruling class to play with because it didn't have any real use to be, they, they couldn't put it to use within the conditions of slave society. It didn't benefit to actually uh, raise the productivity of slaves. And so it's only later on under capitalism that you have figures like James Watt kind of reinventing the steam engine, if you like, and able to introduce it into production. And, uh, and it played a role there of, of basically liberating industry from uh, being tied down to, um, to, to the water sources, which was originally where industry got its power from. It was water power, and, uh, and water turbines, basically, uh, were, were powering industry and, and the mills and so forth before then. And it was uh, under with the steam engine, it suddenly liberates tech, uh, the industry and allows it to move uh, elsewhere. And primarily, you see industries ending up moving to, to where the sources of, of the, uh, the coal that's powering uh, these steam engines. And so it really shows you, again, this phrase we often use, the idea that necessity expresses itself through accident. The, the needs of industry, the needs of science or what really drives society forwards. And these individual figures, these individual so-called geniuses like James Watt uh, and other pioneers of the Industrial Revolution, if you like, they're the accidental figures who happen to, to actually invent those technologies, but it's, it's really the, drives, the driving force is, is the needs of society to, uh, to, to, to develop the, the productive forces. That's ultimately uh, what Marx explained in his uh, materialist conception of history. Now, the thing under capitalism, however, is that this motor force of history, uh, this motor force of capitalism, uh, the, the private ownership, the production for profit, the competition that drives society forwards in, in the capitalism's heyday, what Marx explained, obviously, is that this eventually, this motor force turns into its opposite, and it becomes an enormous barrier, actually, to the development of science and technology. And again, this is something we touched on in yesterday's session, how actually science today is actually being degraded because of private ownership, because of competition, and because of uh, production for profit. You see how there's actually a scarcity of funding and a scarcity of resources. And therefore, although a lot of scientific research is conducted under nominally public bodies, public institutions like the universities, you find these universities are increasingly um, refusing to collaborate with one another because they, they want to keep that data, make sure that they publish first, make sure they get the credit, therefore that they get the funding, and therefore those academics can keep their job. So you see how even in the public sphere, just because the public sphere is within the general system of private ownership and pro production for profit, you end up with this kind of competitive uh, nature creeping into the public sphere and actually uh, the, the laws of competition, the laws of the market infiltrate even into this domain. Um, we also see, obviously, intellectual property rights and how these have become an enormous barrier to uh, the development of uh, science and technology um, and, uh, and how basically uh, 
you know, you've got firms like Google and Samsung and so forth that instead of uh, you know, investing and collaborating together to develop the best phone possible, instead they obviously uh, all have their own departments competing to, to get market share and so forth. And, and, and you, know, you have a ludicrous situation where the, these firms are constantly suing each other uh, over the tiniest of things. I think there was a, a court case once where Apple was suing Samsung because they had tried to use uh, rounded corners or a double tap or something like that. Basic you know, designs and basic you know, uh, methods that should be just shared to create the best phone possible. But you see really, rather than collaborating together so that whole of society benefits, the only people who really benefit are the lawyers who make enormous fees out of all of these court cases. And at the same time, you have the saturation of markets. You have overproduction, this crisis of overproduction on a world scale, with this enormous excess capacity in the system. And what does that mean? It means that there's no more investment. Lo investment actually now is at an all-time low. And, um, and, uh, and particularly, actually, what you see today is how productivity is actually uh, stagnating. There's a very good uh, front cover of The Economist from a, a couple of years ago now, and it's got uh, Rodan's thinker on the front sitting on a toilet saying, will we ever invent anything this useful again? Uh, basically saying there was a period where capitalism, where productivity was, raised, was rising massively, um, but basically that period's long gone, and now productivity's stagnating. And all the big inventions in the past, like plumbing, uh, like electricity, like the telephone and so forth, uh, were actually uh, much more, um, you know, were, were, were gave much more of a boost to productivity than the kind of technologies we see today. And actually how capitalism has created this situation where um, there actually isn't investment in machinery uh, and technology anymore. Instead, uh, the kind of the... the, the, the um, the, the, the downward pressure on wages, basically, because of various uh, factors, has led to basically people using cheap labor rather than machines. And so there isn't investment in machinery, but rather just a, a super exploitation of the working class. And so really we see how capitalism has, has, has got to its limits, really, in terms of its ability to take society forward. And in fact, gone beyond its limits in the sense of you know, using credit and so forth to keep the system going uh, despite reaching uh, all, of these, um, all, all of these contradictions in, uh, that we see around us. And um, uh, yes, Marx explained in his uh, preface to a contribution to a critique on political economy. Marx was never very good with titles to his uh, pamphlets. A uh, bit of a mouthful. But he says how you know, all of history really sees this general development of the forces of production. That's a, a general tendency we see throughout history, a, a general development where you know, today is better than yesterday, tomorrow is better than today. But there are periods in society, in history, where the forces of production come up against the mode of production. In other words, where other, our ability to produce, uh, our, uh, our, our development of science and technology and so forth, comes up against the social relations, and primarily he means the legal relations, really property relations, that prevent us actually utilizing the science and the technology and the, the, the means of production, the, the forces of production that are at our disposal. And that's really what we see today, the fact that that private property has become an enormous barrier now to the development of science and technology and, uh, and to innovation. But what Marx pointed out was that in such periods where you get this, uh, this um, collision between the productive forces and the social relations, that, he says, opens up the period of, of social revolution where the productive forces rebel against the mode of production and, uh, and people feel, they can feel that society isn't going forwards anymore, in fact that it's going backwards. You can see this, as, as I said at the beginning, this abundance of technology around us and yet the rising inequality and the, the, the increasing stress and so forth and uh, how really we're not being liberated by machinery but by, we're being enslaved by it in, instead. Now, as I said, it's, it's fundamentally under capitalism, it's this anarchic and unplanned way in which production develops that is, uh, that is the, the, at the root of the problem. The, you have this invisible hand of the market, as the capitalists are fond of, uh, of, call, of calling it. And there is obviously a general development of science and technology now, even in this period of 
capitalist crisis. But the point is that it develops in this very um, anarchic and chaotic and kind of contradictory way, actually. And the capitalists themselves even have a phrase for this. They call it creative destruction, was the uh, phrase by Joseph Schumpeter. Uh, and basically what he meant was that, that capitalism, basically admitting it, that capitalism can't develop in a kind of smooth, gradual way. It can't, you know, can't build up uh, science, technology, and innovate in a nice, smooth, uh, planned way that, that benefits the whole of society, but rather it, it develops in this chaotic and uh, destructive way where you know, swathes of industry have to be closed down, basically, in order to, to free up the capital and free up the resources for the next wave of technology to be uh, implemented. And we see that very clearly today. We can see that kind of contradictory process of development where new technologies are being brought in but ultimately not to raise our living standards, but simply to replace labor and to, to lower labor costs. And that's what creates this, this enormous contradiction that even the bourgeois are commenting increasingly on now, what they call technological unemployment, which is basically the idea of mass unemployment alongside overwork. And, uh, and, and, the, and in fact, the two condition one, one another, where basically as, uh, as workers are replaced by, uh, by machines, uh, that puts a downward pressure on wages and it forces those who are in work to work harder for fear of losing their jobs. And then obviously the, more the, the, the harder they're working, the more that means other people will be uh, laid off. And, uh, and it's this, this pressure of the reserve army of labor, really, that Marx talked about, that puts this downward pressure on, on wages. And it's what causes workers to kind of uh, sense that, that, that automation isn't benefiting us, that technology isn't benefiting us, that machinery is not improving their li lives. But as I say, they're not being liberated by it, but, but being enslaved by it. And that's why throughout history, you've actually seen these quite militant movements of workers against uh, technology and machinery that originating with the, uh, the Luddites, uh, which now has become a term that, meant, that means basically people who are unwilling to, to kind of support uh, new technologies and people who are stuck in the past and, and are conservative. But actually, the, the, the real Luddites, the actual movement of the Luddites was a very militant movement that went around smashing up the machines because they thought that these machines, and they could see that these machines were replacing them and their labor, and they didn't have the, uh, the kind of political consciousness, if you like, to, to see a way out, the, a socialist way out, and, uh, and therefore they rebelled against this machinery by smashing it up. But we see similar kind of symptoms today where, uh, obviously, uh, you know, a very good example is, is the debate around Trident at the moment, where the, the, the unions actually uh, support Trident, support this enormous waste of money that's never going to get used basically because it keeps jobs in the military industry, in the, uh, in the shipbuilding industry, and so forth. And, uh, and instead of posing a socialist alternative, which says, OK, well, let's you know, get rid of Trident, but, but use the technology and the education that we have to, to, to plan and, and to move workers into new sectors, like, um, like into green energy or into healthcare machinery, using often the same kind of um, technology and skills, actually, uh, you know, many there's there's even clear examples of this in the past. You had an arms factory in Britain called Lucas Aerospace in the 70s, where actually the workers themselves could see that the things they were producing weren't socially necessary. But they came up with a whole list of technologies, very progressive technologies, given the the, the decade they were in. Things like green energy, like healthcare machinery. Uh, that they could build with the same skills and the same machinery they had in the factory. And it shows how actually, again, workers have much more kind of consciousness uh, on these questions than often the leaders of the, of the labor movement who are, who are much more conservative. Uh, because those workers were, were basically saying if they had control of the factory, they could employ their skills and put them to much uh, better use. And, and I think the, we see the same problem today with Trident, where the, the union leaders are stuck in this idea we must keep the jobs rather than saying, well, what we need is to be able to actually plan the economy in a rational way and, uh, and give the working class that control over where uh, production is going. And instead of spending money on these enormous uh, weapons of mass destruction, to use it to actually use these technologies and skills to benefit the whole of society. Now, the problem the capitalists face, however, 
with this uh, technological unemployment is that really they're killing the goose that lays the golden egg. Because at the end of the day, as I say, it's, uh, it's workers that are really the source of all new value in society and the source ultimately of all the profits of the capitalists. Machines, Marx explained, can only transfer the value from, uh, from themselves to the final product. And, uh, and therefore, as you increase uh, in automation in, the, in, um, in society, in, in industry and, and in production and so forth, what you're actually doing is, is increasing what Marx called the organic composition of capital, the, the, the ratio of constant capital, the, the capital from the machinery, from the raw materials, the ratio of that to the wages, to the, the, the amount of labor uh, power that's going into production. And the result of that is a general tendency uh, through uh, increasing automation, through increasing technological development, for, a rate, uh, for the rate of profit in society to actually gradually decrease over time. And, uh, and th at the same time, you also see it uh, play into the, the crisis of overproduction, the fact that these machines, ultimately, that are replacing workers, cannot buy the goods that the machines are producing. And, uh, and it brings to mind a very, a very good uh, story that illustrates this point uh, I believe it was Henry Ford, the, uh, the, the owner of, of the big uh, multinational car company, who, uh, when he was still alive, was showing round, uh, was being shown round one of his factories by, uh, by some workers. And, uh, and he pointed to the machines that were, that were coming into production, creating this new mass production. And he, uh, he, point, he said to the, the trade union leader, uh, look, how are these machines uh, going to pay your union dues? How are they going to support your trade union? And uh, the trade union leader turned around quick as a flash and said, yes, but how are they going to buy your cars? And, uh, and I think that aptly demonstrates the, the contradiction that capitalism faces here, where um, basically the, the, the technology it's using to replace workers uh, basically exacerbates the crisis of overproduction that we see in society and, and, and helps create it. Um, and it really what it shows is, uh, is all of this, is the, is the contradictory nature of capitalism, but where it's, you've got a system where individually each capitalist is doing something that's very rational from their own personal point of view. They're investing in new technology, you know, lowering the, the cost of production, increasing their profits, but the result is that when every capitalist does this, when it becomes generalized across the whole economy, it creates a situation that's completely irrational for the system as a whole. And it reflects what Engels pointed out in his pamphlet, Utopian and, uh, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, where he says, fundamentally, the contradiction under capitalism is this contradiction between private ownership on the one hand but a social mode of production, the fact that we're all interconnected, we're all producing for this general world market, but yet the actual, uh, you know, the actual uh, pieces of this, uh, of this productive process are, are privately owned. And, uh, and this is reflected again in the, uh, in the idea of the, the immense planning that actually exists within the firm, the fact that within these multinational giant corporations, you have planning from the farms and the factories through to the shops and the supermarkets, an immense level of planning in order to improve efficiency and lower costs, but obviously just to increase profits. That enormous planning that goes on inside the firm, but yet this immense anarchy on a, on a, on a, on a social level between the firms. And, um, uh, and ultimately, it, it's, a, it's a, a damning indictment, really, against those who tell you that a uh, you know, planned economy doesn't work. Well, the point is, there is a planned economy, <laughs> but it's happening within these giant firms. And all we want to do is abolish that contradiction uh, between the planning in the firms, in the big businesses, and the anarchy of the market as a whole, and, and have planning across society in a democratic and rational way. And, that, and it's these kind of contradictions that you see that lead to uh, the kind of, uh, like I say, the, 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 the contradictions in capitalism lead to these, these contradictions we see in the whole of society where there's this kind of dystopian vision now where a lot of people are saying well, there's too much automation. You know, the title of this talk, The Race Against the Machine, is actually a book written by a couple of MIT economists who basically hypothesized that actually, we're, that they call it a race against the machine. In other words, we're no longer uh, you know, be using technology 
to gather with our skills to take society forwards, but rather humanity finds itself in a race against the very machines that we've, um, we've invented. It's almost like there's too much automation. And, uh, and so you see, on the one hand, there's this idea that there's, there's too much automation, that we're all in this race against the machine, that we're being laid off by, uh, by the machines and, and it's creating unemployment. But on the other hand, you get this innovation pessimism, they call it. So there's another strand of bourgeois economists like those in the, who are mentioned in this article about will we ever invent anything useful again. There's a whole swathe of economists saying, well, actually, you know, productivity is stagnating. But it doesn't seem to make any sense, you know, that, uh, that on the one hand, we're told there's, um, uh, there's, there's too little productivity growth, but on the other hand, we're told there's too much automation. It seems like a complete contradiction. And, um, and as I said, it's, it's highlighted by, uh, by, the, by the kind of symptoms we see in the world around us today. Paul Mason, uh, uh, quite a famous uh, left-wing economist here in Britain, um, he actually uh, highlights this in his book, Post-Capitalism, where he says how previous waves of technology were kind of driven forwards by, uh, by basically the working class getting organized in the face of uh, attacks and cuts and, uh, and resisting the downward pressure on, uh, on wages. And basically machinery then was brought in as a kind of cheaper alternative. If the working class was strong, it was able to drive wages upwards or at least keep them where they were. And, uh, and therefore, capitalists would bring in machinery because it would uh, be relatively cheaper than employing uh, workers. But what Paul Mason highlights is that the, the, the latest kind of epoch that we face, uh, we don't see this kind of development happening where actually the whole process is stalled now and where because of globalization and the, the competition between workers on a world scale, because of automation and because of a general political attack th through you know, Thatcherism, Reaganism, the attacks on the trade unions, on the working class, all of these pressures collectively have pushed down wages to such a level that it's actually cheaper to, as I say, exploit workers than to invest in new machinery. And he highlights um, uh, a very uh, good example of this where he says, in the past, you would drive your car into, a, uh, into a, an automated car washing machine. You'd see these things where you, know, you drive it in and, and the, all the brushes whirl around and the soaps uh, spurting out and so forth. Now, you don't do that anymore. Those don't exist. And instead, you just have teams of probably highly exploited immigrant labor coming in and washing your car uh, much cheaper than that machine could do it. In other words, we've gone backwards in terms of the technologies that are being used. And there's other key examples you can see of, in similar ways. We're, we're basically offshoring uh, work to places where it's cheaper to produce in Bangladesh and China and so forth. Uh, much cheaper to produce it out there than just to employ machinery to, to do it here in, uh, in Britain or America and so forth. And, um, and, and, and all of this, again, is highlighted by uh, the so-called disruptive technologies that we see around us today. There's, uh, there's a lot of talk these days about the sharing economy or the gig economy, as it's often called. And, uh, and really, these, these two different kind of uh, areas, you know, of apps like uh, Airbnb and Uber and so forth, it's, it, you know, it, it, they highlight actually the, how technology has kind of gone backwards in many respects, how society's use of technology has gone backwards, because we're not really sharing anything in this sharing economy at all. It's actually uh, renting on a mass scale. You know, Airbnb is not acting as an app to help develop uh, technology and to, uh, to develop the forces of production, but rather it's taking advantage of scarcity to turn personal property into a source of profits for the capitalists. So in other words, you know, what, what happens in Airbnb? You, what you've got is a, 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 jet, it's a, a business that arises not to develop housing and to create more housing, but rather uh, it, it, it takes advantage of the fact there's a general lack of accommodation, a lack of places for people to stay, and, uh, and, and offers people the chance to make a bit of money by renting out a spare room and so forth. Um, but actually, uh, all of that ultimately is a source of profits then for Airbnb, which is a giant big business itself. It's turned the personal property of all these individuals into a source of profits for this big business, Airbnb. And it doesn't fundamentally resolve the scarcity 
that's uh, there, the problem in the first place. And in fact, it's actually exacerbated the scarcity in many cases, where you see, uh, for example, in a lot of European cities, I know in Lisbon, for example, I've heard there's a lot of people uh, who will just you know, rent out whole flats to tourists rather than to actually uh, to, to people, locals who need it. And, uh, and in fact, studies on, um, on Airbnb owners show that most of them actually are uh, people who rent out whole flats. So it's not even people with a spare room, you know, efficiently allocating that resource to people who need a spare room. It's people who bought a whole house and they're renting it out uh, through uh, through Airbnb in a in a you know in a profiteering way, so it shows how actually it's it's exacerbating the scarcity rather than solving it, and um, and the gig economy, these things like uh, Uber and uh, Deliveroo and so forth, they're fundamentally again not based on uh, developing the productive forces and uh, you know giving people new tools and new uh, education and so forth, but rather it's based on the precariousness of employment and the precarious of uh, modern jobs, the lack of jobs in society, forcing people to have to find these extra gigs, as they call it, in their spare time to make up for the lack of uh, wages that they have in, uh, in their other jobs. And, um, and, and ultimately, these models, these new kind of uh, supposedly uh, advanced technologies that, that the capitalists are always uh, praising in magazines and in the media and so forth, Fundamentally, these models aren't reinvesting the profits that they create. They, you know, Airbnb and Uber, they're not reinvesting the profits into new public transport, into new housing, and so forth, and, um, uh, or, using, or using it to, the, the, the profits to retrain people into new skills and so forth. So rather than uh, you know, developing the productive forces, they're actually profiting from the very crisis that's led to these problems in the first place. On the other hand, these technologies clearly show, in many respects, the possibility of what a socialist society could achieve. The fact that you have people able to log into an app and find work that needs to be done on an hour-by-hour -hour basis shows you that you could, under a socialist society, get to that situation that Marx talked about, where you are a fisherman in the morning and a, a hunter in the afternoon and a philosopher in the evening. You know, that's the, the kind of situation you could find yourself in with these modern technologies. With, you know, with technologies like, like that used by Airbnb and Uber, we could you know, integrate the whole public transport network, the whole housing uh, you know, system to be able to guarantee cheap accommodation, whether it's uh, for residents or tourists or whatever, and cheap uh, and free, uh, efficient public transport for all. It shows that there's a potential to allocate resources uh, very efficiently and democratically, but obviously we're unable to do that as long as these technologies remain within private hands. And what it really shows, I think, is, uh, is that there's no such thing as a benevolent technology. Um, often people are, uh, you hear some on the left talking about good technologies and bad technologies, but what we've got to understand as Marxists that the technology itself is not either good or bad. The question is a class question of who owns and controls that technology in whose interests. That is fundamentally the question we have to ask ourselves. It's a class question. And we can see that there's plenty of technologies, actually, that eventually end up in society used for social benefits, but only having previously been invented for war and for, for military uses and so forth. And we should ask ourselves, well, why can't we just skip out the middleman and just put them to use in society to help people rather than obviously to, 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 to destroy actually uh, in the first place. Um, and I think you see good examples of this like uh, in, in the question of energy, uh, in the question of, uh, of social media, for example, is a very good example of this where um, often you know, people like to say, oh, Facebook is, uh, is going to benefit the revolution because we can all network with each other. But then those are the people who say, oh no, Facebook's a disaster because now we're all being spied on. And, uh, and it shows you how there's a contradiction within these technologies which arises out of basically who controls and owns them and for what purpose. The reason we're worried about these technologies is because, yes, they are used to spy on us because the, the, the big firms that own them uh, you know, obviously have uh, certain links to the government and so forth and are ultimately trying to use the, the, the information they have to advertise and to sell us things that we don't need. 
But obviously, there's the potential there, again, with these same technologies, to, uh, to have uh, um, you know, a vast level of communication and organization and planning on a social scale, on a, on, a, on a societal level that we previously have never seen. And so it really emphasizes the, 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 the fact that, as Mark said, that under capitalism, we have become the appendage of the machine. That, as I say, that technology hasn't liberated us, but it's enslaved us, and is, it's even destroying the kind of so-called middle-class jobs in the past. There was another economist recently where they had a front cover showing a tornado going through an office space, destroying computers and desks and, and, and throwing uh, white-collar workers up into the air. And it was basically saying how there's actually studies, I think, showing that, that in, from Oxford, I think, there was a study showing they predicted something like 50% of jobs by 2030 could be automated and would be automated. And in fact, the jobs they were talking about weren't the blue collar ones, because they've already been automated largely, but it's the white collar jobs, the so-called educated middle class jobs in accounting and lawyers and even doctors now. You have all these apps and I think the NHS has a thing where you can basically log on and find out what your illness is because of uh, feeding in your symptoms and so forth. And um, uh, yeah, and you can see all these technologies basically now actually threatening even to, to take away that kind of privilege layer in society. And it shows how, you know, uh, it shows the potential on the one hand, but obviously how under capitalism all of these things have become a nightmare. I think, you know, in the, in, in the past they actually had science fiction writers a century ago who, who, who said that they thought the, uh, the biggest problem facing mankind in the future would be that we'd be bored all the time, basically. We'd be, there'd be too much leisure time, and we wouldn't have, know what to do with ourselves. Uh, we'd have too much leisure time. And, uh, and, and, and obviously, this hasn't happened. We, we haven't uh, got more leisure time. We're working harder than ever. But it shows how if you had a socialist plan of production, a rational plan of production, uh, where you could actually use these technologies to reduce the hours of the working week and, uh, and allow everyone then to participate in the running of society. It's this technology that capitalism's created but can no longer use in, a, in an efficient and an effective way. It's these technologies that could actually pave the material way, you know, provide the material conditions for the kind of democracy that we need to see under a future socialist society. It would actually create the time that would actually in turn um, allow us to, to everyone to participate in the running of society, to educate ourselves, to develop art and culture and so forth, and, and yes, to develop science too. We'd be able to actually have lifelong learning and retraining. And instead of, uh, as Marx called it in Capital, the accumulation of misery at one pole and the accumulation of wealth at other, we could, uh, we could you know, raise living standards, uh, reduce the hours of the working week, and, um, and actually go about uh, planning how we use the resources in society for the benefit of everyone in society. But obviously, under capitalism, we don't see this kind of uh, utopian vision that, that, science, you know, that science fiction writers have, have dreamt about in the past or that, that we can dream about today, like in the session yesterday when we had talked about what will socialism look like. This is what socialism could look like on the basis of all this technology. But under capitalism, obviously, what we see is a dystopian vision, the race against the machine, the innovation pessimism that I talked about earlier, the sense that something is fundamentally stalled in terms of progress in society. And I would say that feeling that society, uh, and that, that technology is stalled, this innovation pessimism that the capitalists talk about, that we're not developing science and technology anymore, that, that productivity isn't increasing anymore. That kind of pessimism fundamentally reflects the impasse of the whole system. It reflects the impasse of the system that these people are defending, the inability for, to, to, for capitalism to take society forwards. So there's an enormous potential, is what we can see with technology. We see a potential, really, not just to you know, lower the hours of the working week and to make work easier, but fundamentally to do away with work altogether. That's what we want to do. We, just, we don't want to get rid of class society. We want to get rid of the need for work fundamentally altogether. The, I think Trotsky even talked about a day where eventually you would press a button and the whole, uh, the whole productive system, the whole economy would just kind of 
you know, work its way out and, uh, and produce the things we needed, and we could lie back and, uh, and actually really discuss the kind of, you know, bigger questions in society rather than constantly just having to work out where, we're, you know, how we're going to next put food on the table. In that sense, it would, put, you know, pave the way for a plethora of, of art and culture and creativity. And really, it would be the beginning of real history, the real history of humanity would start from that point. It would, as Engel said, take us from the kingdom of the necessity to the kingdom of freedom. And our task really is to make this dream a reality, and that means fighting for revolutionary change in Britain and internationally. I'll leave it there.